It's episode 20. Can you believe it? I'm Sandy Gulliver, host of Just Us, and I'm here with my co-host, Daryl Enniskeld and Sandra Baskin, and hey. our very, very special guest today, Chris Argos. You may Hi, know everybody. Him. You may know Chris because years ago, he wrote a book. Chris is, was an actor in Chicago, <clears throat> and he wrote a book about how to make a, actually make a living. Actually, I have the book here. I can look right there. It's called- I have it too somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Don't get it. Um, But it says on the bottom, making a living doing commercials, voiceovers, TV, film, and more. And that's the important part because most actors in Chicago can't make a living doing acting. In this book, he kind of gives you some clues on how it is possible. And Chris, I don't know if you made a living in Chicago, but you must be making a living out there because you just moved to L.A. When did you move to L.A.? So we've been in L.A. five years now. Oh, my goodness. I know time flies. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, it was a big transition. It took forever to finally, you know, make the move. But uh, once we did, we jumped in with both feet and it's been it's been an interesting five years. Well, I noticed on your IMDb page that you have some good credits out in L.A., Grey's Anatomy, or some of those other ones, uh, House of Cards, you know, shows that we've actually heard of. Right. <laughs> so when people say, well, what would I have seen you in? You have things that you can actually say. But let's I get back to the beginning, do. because it wasn't always like that. Will you tell us how you decided to write this book? Yeah, uh, the book Acting in Chicago came out of my experience teaching Chicago actors. Um, When I got started, I obviously took a bunch of classes. And then the more success you have, eventually people ask you to start teaching. And so I I began teaching classes and noticed that the, the students were mostly asking the same questions over and over again. And the things that they were asking about were things that were not easy to come by just you know, talking with an agent or sitting in a waiting room at an audition and chatting with other actors. It was, it was stuff you really kind of had to live through in order to, to be able to get the knowledge from those experiences. So I thought, well, if everybody has the same question, there ought to be a resource where someone can go and get the answers to those things without having to put in a decade or more in the business to be able to get some insight out of it. So the book came out of that idea and, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, when, when it was brand new, when the first edition came out back in, you know, 19, uh, or I'm sorry, 20, 2009, I think was the first edition. It was the, the first book of its kind then. And it really hasn't, yeah. it's been updated three times since then. And, and there really isn't another book like it right now. Um, so it's still, it's still relevant. And I'm, I'm very proud that, Almost on a daily basis, I get emails or DMs or shout outs on social media or whatever from people who have read it and who appreciate, you know, the information in it. So um, the book has been, it's been great. It's been great for other people. It's been great for me and my career. It's been, Uh it's been a game changer. Well, in my case, I read it. I have the first audition. So audition. So I read it and I almost had to stop and look and see who the author was because I was so surprised my name wasn't on the front because I could have written it. You see? experienced every single pitfall. That you should I have written it. <laughs> I, I should have. You should have. Yeah, because um, you made all the same mistakes that so many of us made because mm-hmm. back in those days, we really didn't have the networking that is pretty prevalent now, even right. with, especially with the, the uh, pandemic, we're all on Facebook, we're all on Zoom, we're all exchanging notes. But back then, when an actor just starting out doesn't have a clue, and I certainly didn't. You, you talk about in the book, everything that you did wrong, warning your readers about it so that they don't make those same mistakes. Mm-hmm. So the book is just invaluable. I mean, even though I have a first edition, everything is still still current. 
Yeah, the later editions were updated with relevant information as the business changed. So, for example, the latest edition has a big section on self-taping because when the first edition came out, nobody self-taped anything. We were like, self-tape? What? You know, what is that? So um, now it's, of course, you know, I, I've been sort of beating the self-taping drum for years now, like saying, this is here to stay. It's not going to go anywhere. It's not a fad. And then, of course, the pandemic came and, and made it the only way you could audition. Mm -hmm. um, and now I believe even more that, you know, having a, a repeatable, reliable self-tape solution is an absolute necessity for an actor. It's just like, you know, headshots used to be. Yes, you have to have a headshot. But today you also have to have a self-tape solution, which means something, some equipment that you can quickly go to, easily set up tap a couple of buttons and, and make it work for you mm -hmm. over and over and over again. Um, make it look and sound good. You know, you have to have that. Otherwise, you kind of can't be competitive. So it's interesting how the business changes over time. Do you do any Zoom um, classes on how to do a good self-tape? Um, I probably should. I, <laughs> I don't. Um, and... It's interesting because I've had a, I, I do a little blogging at actinginchicago.com. It's the yeah. companion site to the book. Um, and I, I've done a, a series of articles on self-taping there, uh, but I haven't done like a Zoom class or, or even a YouTube video on it. I probably should. I feel like self-taping is one of those subjects that has been by now really, really covered. Um, there, there's no shortage of of resources out there. If, if you want to know how to do a good self tape, most people just go to YouTube and there's like at least a dozen pretty reputable videos. So when I take a project like that on, I try to take on something that I think I can either do better than what's out there, or I can add something that I don't see out there. That's why the book, um, uh, the acting in Chicago book was, you know, pretty was something that I was willing to take on. It was a lot of work. Sandra, you had your hand up. Yes, I wanted to ask you, when's the last time you taught a class at Acting Studio Chicago? You're still on the wall there. Am I still on the wall? Yeah, That's funny. Yeah. Um, I spent a lot of time at Acting Studio Chicago. I love those guys there. The last time I was there was the fall of 2019. Um, I was in, in Chicago for something, I don't remember what, and I taught a uh, moving to Los Angeles workshop. So. Yeah. I on a Saturday, it was a three hour thing. And uh, we're actually talking about doing a Zoom version of that again in the next couple of months, because, you know, as the pandemic kind of winds down, people are more interested in revisiting the idea of, of working in a market other than their own. Um, so for those of you who are thinking about moving to LA, watch the Acting in Chicago or the uh, Acting Studio Chicago site. Well, we ought to have a workshop up pretty soon. Okay, they're a great school. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Also, there are other areas now besides LA that are drawing actors. Right. Um, Atlanta and where else, ladies? Louisiana. <clears throat> oh, um, New yeah. Mexico. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I heard it's getting a lot of stuff. Right. New Mexico. I think I heard Austin is kind of taking off oh. a little bit. Um, so, yeah, you don't have to go to LA uh, for sure or New York. Um, you know, but I, I do think it's worth asking, like, what are you hoping to gain? Of course, yeah. Um, by moving, because there, my thought process is if you're going to have access to the same type of work, only in a just kind of a different market, then I'm not sure it's worth the expense and hassle to move. Because um, moving is not cheap and it's not easy. And it doesn't matter if you're, you know, 22 years old with nothing attaching you to Chicago, or if you've got a a family to think about, it's it's not a simple thing to do. So I think you should do it for a, a good reason. Not inexpensive to move to California. That's a fact. <laughs> that's a fact. That's why I was so surprised when you moved there because you have two boys and that uh, you know, uproots them too. So you obviously had a good reason to move to LA. Now, that was... when you were in Chicago, were you getting LA gigs? which kind of helped with your decision or did you go out there hoping to? Um, I had gotten a fair amount of TV work 
in Chicago, the, the TV Chicago work that was available in, in Chicago. <clears throat> uh, I had never booked anything out of an LA casting office when we decided to move. Oh. And we, the reason I, I moved from Chicago to LA was because I wanted access to work that I didn't have access to in Chicago. Um, and so back at that time, I think this is less true now, but back at that time, you know, you really had to be physically where the casting is. You didn't have to be where the project shoots, but you needed to be in the mix where all the casting happens. Um, and so we decided to, to go and, and our boys played it actually a pretty big role in that because we had to time it in such a way that it made sense for them. Um, and so we, uh, we have 11, they're 11 now, but at the time they were um, five-year-old twin boys and they were going into kindergarten. And we were at that stage that a lot of parents come to where it's like, okay, are we gonna stay in our school districts? And are we gonna going to, you know, go do the whole path with the kids, you know, kindergarten, elementary school and, and stay where we are, or are we gonna leave? And at the, at the time we were living in, a, in, in Chicago in the city and our local school really wasn't an option. Like we didn't wanna send our boys there. So the question was, do we up and leave for the suburbs or some other district? Or do we just kind of rip the bandaid off and go to LA because we had been talking about it for a long time before wow. we actually did it. And um, we decided that that moment was the, the best moment to give it a try. Uh, because once they got older and got more established with friends and, you know, activities and stuff like that, it would just be harder to yank them away from all of that. So we decided to go ahead and, and do it, uh, at that point. And in terms of work, you know, my goal was just to, to land in projects that I would not have been able to land in if I was a Chicago based talent. And, you know, uh, I have a, I, I had a decent success rate so far with that. I mean, I could always, like any actor, I could always be busier. I could always do more. It, it would be great if I had, you know, more credits, but I have at least accomplished that goal. Yeah, you sure have. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. So do you have a network out in LA of um, a group of friends that also came from Chicago that you... There are a lot of Chicagoans out here. Um, so yeah, I keep in touch. Actually, the people I keep in touch with mostly are former students of mine that I met in Chicago and taught and then now live in LA. So um, there are our babysitters and they come over and, and hang out and, and you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. So we definitely have friends in Los Angeles. It's not like, you know, it's difficult to make friends here, but um, we find that we seem to, to jive really well with the Midwesterners because we're all kind of, of in the course. same boat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we let's, uh, let's, let's take a little turn here. I did have a question that popped into my mind the other day about agent. Well, actually, I think it's more the casting agencies have what they call, what is called the top five, which means that, um, say, for instance, a director contacts the agency and says, send me your top five. First of all, is it true? And secondly, mm -hmm. they can't just have, these are my top five best actors because maybe the role is very specific and you can't have five people walking in and they don't even fit the role. So they, do they have a top five for every type? Um, so I've never worked in casting, so I can't give you like a firsthand answer, but I've been doing this long enough that I have picked a couple of things up. So I'll give you my two cents about that. Um, I think largely it depends on the client and what they're asking for. Yeah, so a casting office, you know, works with uh, different directors, different production companies, different creative entities, right? And every project is a little different. Every role is a little different. So, you know, you might have one project that where the director just wants to see a really wide swath of the market, right? It's like, okay, here's a role, but I want to see 17 people or I want to see 25 people. Um, if, there are, if there's time and budget to allow for that and that's what the director is asking for, then that's what casting is going to provide. If 
you know, if the opposite can also be true, like it might be lower budget or lower time frame, uh, and or you might just have a director that's like, you know what, I don't want to be overwhelmed. I just want to see your top three or your top five. Wow. Then it's up to the casting to, you know, kind of narrow down the choices and, you know, based on what the director has explained they want for the role to actually present just the top five. So I think it's hard to make blanket statements about like casting offices just show directors their top five. I'm sure that happens, but I'm also sure that that there's a lot of variation there. Um, in the end, you know, there's so much variation and so many things that go into a casting decision that for us, for for actors, I think you you pay no mind to any of it except what's on the page and what you know. So, you know, you got to do justice to the words on the page and then if you have the time and uh, and you think it would be beneficial, you can maybe look up the the director or the advertising agency or the client, depending on what kind of audition it is, uh, and find out a little bit about the director and the writer. Um, you can do this on IMDb Pro. You can do it on um, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes on Twitter or Instagram. You could just kind of get a feel for what turns them on, what what you know they like to cast. Um, because actors typically don't, we're not armed with a ton of information as we go into auditions. We, we get sides, you know, a lot of times we don't even get a full script anymore and we get a character description and a breakdown. And that's kind Isn't of it. always been that way. I mean, have you, are you, are you used to getting full scripts? Um, yeah, I, I, I will occasionally still get a full script, but it doesn't happen wow. much. It used to be the norm. Um, it, it depends on what kind of role you're auditioning for. Obviously, if you're a series regular, they, they want you to have the whole script because oh, you, know, you need to have yeah. figure out where you fit in the picture. If you've, you're going in for a co-star, you're probably not going to get the whole script. Although I have gotten full scripts for co-star auditions. So it just, it just depends. Hmm. Um, Sandra? I have uh, a question now with regard to that five thing. As you were speaking about it, it in my head, I'm going, what good would it do us to know anyway? Well, no one all. thing we could say, well, you know, they've probably just taken their top five. And, oh, okay. That's why I feel better now. Because yeah. you're not I don't think that changes your five. performance, though. I don't think, no, you know, you, yeah. you, you don't alter your approach based on that. And maybe we don't really want to know, you know, that... <laughs> <laughs> or we just yeah. have to do our job with an audition and go in there and just be you. Right. Yeah. Well, and, you know, just, <laughs> right. It just try to do, you know, do justice to what, to what the words tell you to do. Um, and a lot of times, like on some commercial auditions, you know, they could be auditioning in multiple cities. And so, you know, you're one of three sure. being called sure. back in Chicago, but you have no idea who's being called back from, you know, anywhere else. So it's, that's one of those weird mind games you can play with yourself, but there really is no benefit to it. It's one of those things you just can't control. So I try not to worry about it too much. I heard the timer go off and that yeah. couldn't possibly be 15 minutes. Yeah. Not possible. Let's, yeah. let's well, keep talking. It was, um, well, that 15 minutes reminder was that we have to start winding down. And so Usually we use some of this time to have you tell us a little bit about how um, people can find your book and your website and- And your blog. Yeah, your blog. Sure, I can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please do. Uh, so if you're interested in learning a little bit more about how to build and cultivate an acting career as a Midwest-based actor, you can check out the book. Acting in Chicago. It's available on Amazon. It's also, um, I blog at actinginchicago.com. So you can check out, um, there are years of blog posts there now. So there's quite a bit of information. And if you're interested about finding out a little more about voiceover, maybe you're an actor or someone who's interested in um, exploring what the world of voiceover has available to you, uh, I wrote a book called The Voiceover Startup Guide. And you can get that also on Amazon or you can visit uh, complete-voiceover.com. And what's interesting about this, there are a lot of voiceover books out there, but we use an interesting combination of step-by-step -step instruction and audio files, downloadable audio files and practice scripts so that you can actually hear what's being taught. Uh, and we have a series of books 
covering all kinds of subjects like commercial voiceover. We also have a book for movie trailers and um, written by um, a, a movie trailer narrator. So you can check out complete-voiceover.com for VO info. Okay, we're going to be putting all that website information on the underneath the YouTube video. So nobody has to write all that stuff down. It's all going to be handed to you when Great. you click in to watch the video. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. All on Amazon, Chris. Can all your books be found on Amazon? Yep. If you just search for my name on Amazon, you'll find all of them. And there they are. Yay. Okay. I also I found that voiceover in Chicago seems to be not quite as popular or it's so popular that rarely do people get the, I, I don't know. I'm, try, I'm working my way through that whole genre <laughs> and, right. and what they're looking for. So the voiceover world has changed a lot. I, I'm not going to opine about the way it used to be, but it's very polarized right now in the sense that there are people at the top of the business working a lot and making a really good living. Yeah. And then a lot of the, the clients have gone uh, the way of, of a lot of things where budgets are very tight and, and the pay is not great. And so you have uh, a lower end of the business where you just don't earn very much. And there's tons of people now because it has been opened up yep. um, because the technology has gotten so cheap and easily available. Mm -hmm. There's there's just tons of people uh, exploring it and, and trying it. And so you're bumping up against the numbers a lot if right. you're doing voiceover now. So it's a, it's a different beast than it used to be. Yeah. Well, and it's something people could do and be at home during the pandemic. I, the pandemic has created a lot of what you just said, right? Um, that's true. Although voiceover really was always a kind of a stay at home business um, since about a, a yeah. 10 years ago. You yeah, know, as good. soon as we were all able to put, you know, really good sounding studios in our houses for not a lot of money, mm -hmm. a lot of the auditions, all the auditions went home and a lot of the sessions went home as well. So, you know, stuff that I record at home is wound up being broadcast on air and you would never know that it did, you know, that I recorded it in a space that cost a fraction of what a professional recording studio would, you know, yeah, would cost right, to build. Right. So, um, so yeah, it's, it, the pandemic has obviously exacerbated that because it forced everyone to stay at home. Right. That's what I meant. Right. Yeah. Well, don't give up hope, Daryl. Just keep plugging away at it. Oh, I do. Every time I shoot one, okay, shoot yourself on the foot again. Okay. Let's do it again. We'll try it one more time. One more time. So you, okay. you can't okay, score if you don't shoot. So okay. you gotta, you gotta shoot. You're right. So Chicago is about if, if you're ever interested is gaining four new shows hmm. um, this summer and um, Cinespace is expanding uh -huh. almost as we speak. And um, so it's, it's good for the Chicago person or the person who's moved to LA if they ever want to come back that a lot more is being um, shot here. And yeah, so it's great to see, especially as someone who I, I was in Chicago when there was nothing going on. Mm -hmm. And then Dick yeah. Wolf came and kind of changed the whole landscape when Cinespace opened. I mean, that was that was the beginning. And it's great to hear that it's not only surviving, but thriving and growing. That's really mm -hmm. great to hear. Very cool. Yeah. All We're right. All well, then, let's call it a day. We can't believe how fortunate we were to get you to come on our show, Chris. You're, you're such a wonderful actor and a wonderful person. Oh, and it's kind of you to say thank you for asking. Happy to do it. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, then. Until next time. Bye, everybody. Adios. Chris, love to have you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>